Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, ladies and gentlemen, it's important to know your history, and if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming you do because you're listening right now, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. Uh, you can find us over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In the Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd really appreciate it. Also, please check us out on the social media, as the kids call it, for all sorts of updates. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we're on Instagram at either at In the Seats or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. Uh, and finally, and I do dare say most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest from the world of film, film festivals, television, basically the moving image at large, because uh, if we love to watch it, we love to write about it and talk about it, and we love it when you come read about it, so please stop on by. You know what? This is a special episode. We got a big one for you today. Uh... We are talking with famed music documentarian Robert Muggy, whose film uh, Deep Blues, which just got remastered and is playing uh, a limited run at the Metrograph in New York, but also is getting ready to come out on DVD and I do believe Blu-ray uh, this coming November from our friends over at Film Movement. It is a real, it's a real fascinating road trip of a movie that sort of... Uh, gets us into the deep, deep sort of undercurrent of the history of the blues and how the music evolved and where it's come from. And, and it, it literally, like, quite literally takes us to the crossroads. And uh, we had such a great time talking with Robert Muggy, not just about this film, but his entire canon of work, because he's done some excellent films with the likes of Gil Scott Heron. He's done with uh, the Gospel According to Al Green, which is just an amazing film. And we talk about all of it and more. So uh, please enjoy uh, please enjoy our talk with uh, Robert because I sure as hell know that I did. Now, I mean, obviously, just to kick it off officially, just thank you so much for the time. Congre you know, just... And congratulations on getting the like Deep Blues getting remastered. It's it's such a seminal film. But I mean, I got to go back a little bit for your career. And actually, I got to pull a line from your website, which really made me laugh. Uh, just that the films you made in your early days, they seem the ones that seem to get finished were the music ones. Oh yeah, early on, I had I was writing screenplays. I had uh, had uh, dreams of doing all sorts of fiction films and. Uh, and uh, I thought, well, I'll do these fun little music films on the side. And that's what got funded. And people basically seemed to like them. So I kept making them as long as what, the funding, you know, was coming. <laughs> well, I mean, and that kind of leads into a line from uh, the that Gil Scott Heron said in, in, uh, in that film, just that he was a bluesologist. And I mean, I love that line. And it feels like your career, you are almost a cinematic bluesologist in many ways. I'm going to turn off this zoom light. Oh, do it. Yeah. <laughs> if I can find, there it is. I'm sorry. Um, a cinematic bluesologist. I like that. I might steal that. Do it. <laughs> but I mean, I'm kind of curious, when did you know sort of the pivot point for you was to maybe I should lean into the music stuff a little bit more. Gosh, it probably was an incremental process. Um, Cause I mean, I always had two great loves. One was film and one was music. And mm. that's, continue to this day. I mean, I also like theater and politics sure. and all sorts of other things, but the things that got me really passionate, really involved were film and music. And, you know, I guess getting to start out with a film on Pulitzer Prize winning American composer, George Crumb, sort of sealed that for me that I said, huh, I can do all sorts of things with this that I could do with any other film, uh, any other genre of film. I can have themes. I can, I can uh, think in, in structural terms, in visual terms, in how I use audio. And in fact, I did a lot of experimentation in that film kind of based on 
what I'd learned from um, taking a course with uh, the late film theorist uh, Slavko Borkopich, as well as from a book uh, called Theory of, uh, of Film Practice by Noel Birch, which um, sort of went through Brisson and Godard and all kinds of people and laid out really interesting structural formalist things you could do with film. So in fact, I loaded a whole bunch of them in, into that film. You know, I shot, I shot scenes in black and white and then the scenes from his life, I tinted green and the scenes from his art, I tinted blue. And then I ha all had them come together into full color at the end. I did all these things and got it out of my system and, and still cared about, uh, for, have cared, since then about, um, you know, visual elements, uh, uh, audio elements and so forth, um, but have been in the years since then have cared more about communicating than about putting too much focus on me as the one doing it. Right. But more focus on on my subject and on the themes related to that subject. This, the films have sort of split since you kind of lead into this the films have kind of split over the years early on i did more films that were individual portraits and i used the case of this one individual to lead to larger themes and then over time including with deep blues i ended up taking on a much broader subject and having lots of smaller points in the film that it might be a portrait of an artist or focus on a particular theme and so forth so that most of my films have sort of broken down into those two types either the portrait film or the broader look at a at a genre or very often a musical genre but but also at different kinds of people and institutions that support independent musicians, be it music festivals, blues cruises, uh, record, independent record labels, um, people with whom uh, I relate because I too am trying to support uh, these artists in any way that I can. So I've often made them part of the story. Well, and I mean, I love that you bring up just the subjects, because I mean, especially from earlier on in your career, I mean, Black Wax, I mean, it's probably one of my personal favorites, but Gil Scott had this reputation for being this enigmatic character. Can you talk a little bit just in terms of getting him to agree to have you follow him around with a camera? <laughs> and one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And uh, we just had a great time together. You know, I had already, with my Sun Ra film, kind of forged this style of... Um, Allow, being a facilitator for what the artist himself later herself also wanted to present and so with the Sun Ra film Terry Gross of Fresh Air back when the film came out 40 years ago talked about Sun Ra engaging in soliloquies throughout throughout the film I thought that was a really good way to put it and and I just collaborated with Sun Ra and then did with Gil in the, in the next film on on creating structures in which they could improvise or you know I would tell Sun Ra it would be really cool if we went and filmed this place or filmed you against this background or talked about this and then he got so into it he started calling me up and doing the same thing and like with Gil Scott Heron you know there was this happy coming together of possibilities because uh, Gil's birthday was April 1st and he had this concert scheduled um, for April 1st at the Wax Museum nightclub in Washington, D.C. And he was living in the D.C. area at that time and I had grown up in the D.C. area and we both had a lot to say about D.C. as a black city and so forth. But this Wax Museum nightclub was the former wax museum the equivalent of you know a, a cut rate madame tussauds uh in the dc area and so when i called them about getting rights to shoot gill's concerts there they told me how they had all these wax figures uh well i asked them what happened to your wax figures they said, oh we ha have them all in this giant storeroom so i said great so may we come in and build a set out of those wax figures and they said uh they said, sure, why not? And then Gil, of course, was really into it because like wax figures of 
important historical figures, figures from the Harlem Renaissance, you know, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, um, Langston Hughes, all these people were great for him to work off of, as were a series of U.S. presidents, as was Betsy Ross, as he says, working on the flag or whatever. But so then Gil came to me while we were shooting that and he said, here, I got this audio cassette. I'm working on this new album called Moving Target. And I got this song called Washington, D.C. Maybe you'd like to just like, um, you know, put it on the soundtrack or something. And what it was, was um, he uh, he had recorded the words to this song, which basically contrasts the official white city and the actual thriving, pulsing black city. And um, uh but he, what he had recorded was a few instruments and then a very faint vocal track um, as a guide track for recording other instruments done. And I said, I asked, do you have a, a boom box? And he said, yeah. So I said, when we meet on the streets of the city tomorrow, could you bring this tape and the boom box? And he did. We put the tape in the boom box. My audio guy put a microphone right on his shirt. And then he sang as it played. And so then we, as you, you know, yeah. we marched him around the monuments and the Capitol. We marched him through uh, Howard University, the great black university and all this, singing this song. And that became a, a recurring, you know, a thread through, through the film. But, uh, but he was a joy. Unfortunately, it it was two years into his free base in Coke. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it did, wasn't a problem then, but the following year when uh, we worked together at um, Sunsplash in Jamaica, it had started to be a problem. And he, he put on a brilliant performance, but we actually had planned together that Black Wax was gonna be the first of a trilogy. And what we would do is uh, sort of the, the black route of, I mean, the route of slavery from Africa to the Caribbean to the to North American mainland, um, we would trace in reverse. So just as I had him walking all around DC in black wax, I was going to have him walk around Jamaica as we filmed Cool Runnings, and then we were then I was going to try to do a film on uh, African music. This would have all been in you know the early '80s, and uh, we would have let Gil go around and say his brilliant things there. Unfortunately, in Jamaica, it became evident that um, although he was still witty, although he was still funny, although he was still smart, he was having a hard time doing the sort of Im improvisational chatting that he did in the first film. So we let that go. And then I decided, then I got Channel 4 in England, which had funded the Gil Scott Heron film to agree to a fund, to, to fund a film on Al Green, um, primary, you know, called Gospel According to Al Green. And then after that, I was going to do one with George Clinton. So it was gonna be a supposed trilogy on black music and politics, black music and religion, black music and celebration. But George Clinton's manager at the time told me that the band had spent a million dollars on Coke in the last year and that he'd set it up for me to film George and the group if uh, Parliament Funkadelic, if I wanted, but he couldn't tell, he couldn't guarantee they would show up. Oh no. And so so then I was gonna do a film with Stephen Sondheim. He had this new musical called Sunday in the Park with George. Which was, uh, which was in preparation at the time. And so he was into it and I was into it. And I finally got Channel 4 Television in England into it. And uh, then they started having all kinds of problems among the collaborators. And, and he said they just, couldn't, uh, he, they just couldn't have cameras around, which one of the biggest career heartbreaks of my life. But so Ruben Blades was happening then with this album, Buscando America, in this whole crossover from um, salsa music, Latin music into the American mainstream. And so I convinced Andy Park, the crazy Glaswegian from Scotland, uh, who, who was the commissioning editor for music to make, as he was just leaving the channel on his way out the door, he approved the money for me to make the Ruben Blades film. So it's not a trilogy, but at least it's three of my favorite 
films. I told well, you. I mean, I, I, getting a question in can be a problem. I know. <laughs> I love that you brought up Al and Ruben, though, because I mean, honestly, I think those two films of yours are probably the most intimate films. I mean, how did sort of the, your work with Sunrod and your work with Gil sort of sell you to them to sort of be able to be embedded and kind of do this kind of stuff because they were really personal films that I, we really felt connected to the, to Al and to Ruben during the whole process. I will say, although I love, you know, it's like your children, you love everyone in different ways and you feel, and it, being films, you feel like you accomplish different things with every film. But I have to say the Al Green film is still probably my favorite of my films. And it is because of that intimacy. It is because of that passion. I mean, among the things I try to do with my films, I, when I can, I like to try to obviously get, get artists at their um, uh, at the peak of their powers. I don't know why I just straightened up my hair when this is going to be audio only. Uh, but I like to get them at the peak of their powers. Uh, I like to um, be able to come up with visual approaches to storytelling. I like to develop themes. And of course, with the Al Green film, the themes included, um, you know, just a base. Well, here's how I used to introduce the film, including at the Toronto Film Festival, many <laughs> years ago when it played there. Um, I said, this is a film about love, about the connections between soul music and gospel, and about a man who flew too close to the sun, got his eyeballs burned, and has been singing ever since with fire coming out of his mouth. So those were pretty much the themes of the film. And I was very fortunate that, um, you know, I decided that the song Let's Stay Together, which he and producer Willie Mitchell did not, because Al freaked out and decided he was going to do gospel music. So I decided that needed to be a recurring image to the film. And Al was not, Al was only doing gospel at that point. So the only re way I got him to do any of his old hits were asking him about them while we did the long interview and he had a guitar in his lap much of the time. And so he, he performed little bits of a few of the songs, but then he kept, kept not following through on his promise to give me a long interview and kept putting it off and putting it off. And I, you know, I've got a crew that can't stay in Memphis forever. And so I said, would you mind doing a rehearsal for us? Could we, you know, you just kind of stage a rehearsal. And, and so he's thinking gospel music rehearsal. And so they did a whole bunch of gospel tunes for us in rehearsal in his own private studio at Al Green Music. And then I said, gee, you know, I haven't heard that song, Let's Stay Together in so long. I really love that song. Would you, would you mind just for us doing that? And so we had to teach it to his background singers because they'd never performed it, which we also filmed. And, um, and then he did it. And so it helped tie together, you know, that we had also filmed Willie Mitchell with the original record playing in his studio as he talked, you know, with a certain amount of sadness about, actually after that film was made, he did go on and work with Al a couple more times and they did sort of semi gospel albums but at that time after all those huge hits um you know their their partnership was essentially over no it's it's it makes you think of what could have been but i mean i i'm, I'm glad it's your favorite film too of yours because i think it's my favorite <laughs> film as well okay. my you know my mother's favorite of my films my late mother um what was the sun Ra film Really? It's always shocked the hell out of me. You know, my parents, my parents were very liberal, but they were also very religious and, um, you know, Luth Luth Lutherans. And um, that would have been the last thing in the world I would have expected her to relate to. But, you know, she grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, as Sun Ra did. And there's something so spiritual about Sun Ra. I mean, I used to feel like the concerts I went to of his back in the 70s, I used to feel like they were almost gospel presentations. You know, there was so much spirit in the room and and, and all that. So it, but anyway, it always sort of tickled me that in some ways the farthest out of my films was, was her favorite. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, I, I love the spiritual angle as well because I think for Deep Blues, I, like for me personally, it feels like a very spiritual journey in many ways because... 
like you're following these guys, not necessarily when they're going to Monaru or doing big concerts. You're seeing them in the juke joints. You're seeing them in the deep south. How important was it for you to sort of capture these moments and capture this music in its element as opposed to sort of somewhere else? Oh, man, you you hit the veritable nail on the head. Um, as you can probably tell from um, films of mine over the years, one of my key goals has been I'm not always able to do it. Sometimes I have to film people at a festival or, um, or on a blues cruise or something like that. But whenever possible, I like to film the music in the community out of which it came with the artists of that community, their own, their own community. And against the geography, the, the, the background, physical background where people are used to seeing it. So in this case, yes, that's, juke joints and that's front porches and we film it uh uh urban urban clubs also but um y- you know that that film was nicely timed for me because it, as as you brought up there's sort of and and as i concurred with there's that sort of progress from these early portraits often confined to or a handful of places and all to more and more doing these broader films, some of which involve essentially musical road movies. Mm. And to, although I went on the road to shoot things in a single place, like to Jamaica, Montego Bay, Jamaica for Cool Runnings, or to, um, or I did this thing with Bob Hope and others called Entertaining the Troops about entertainers who entertain troops in World War II um, and stuff. And so, you know, went out, uh, Hollywood to interview him there and all starting oh and even to Hawaii for my Hawaiian music film but I mostly only had the money for that one Hawaiian rainbow to shoot on Oahu the you know the primary island but that led to my getting money for a film called that I called Kumuhula Keepers of a Culture which is about Hawaiian dance but also focuses heavily on the music that, that goes with that dance um <clears throat> excuse me and um this required not only getting a crew to Hawaii, plus hiring a few people there, but it meant um, driving around islands and it meant flying among six different islands. So I got this good practice at going and filming music on the road and finding ways to tie everything together. And frankly, you know, I had a, I was sort of, especially early on, it was a goal of mine to kind of work in lots of different American genres or North American genres. And um, uh, I kept thinking, gee, it'd be really nice to do a film about Mississippi blues. You know, I'd, I'd really, I had a couple friends, filmmaker friends who taught in, uh, in Memphis and then I'd made the, the Al Green film primarily in Memphis. And I'd really started to get more and more into the culture down there. And uh, so then this came out of the blue that Dave Stewart of Eurythmics, who growing up in the north of England, um, whether you hear it in his music or not, and I hear it in some things, not in others, but was heavily influenced by the blues and had this cousin who was a teacher in Memphis and who would send him blues and rockabilly and rock and roll um, 45s and albums and blue jeans and all these American cultural items and um, and wanted to pay something back. I mean, I, you know, there's lots of artists like Bonnie Raitt and people like that who have paid back to the, the blues artists, rhythm and blues artists who've influenced them and so forth. But to, I think this may be where a single artist dug so deeply into his own pockets to fund an effort like this. And uh, what happened was he had been influenced as so many have been by Robert Palmer's book, Deep Blues. Mm. And so he had his uh, primary assistant, his COO, as he called her, Eileen Gregory. He had her spend a year researching what they could do with, uh, in terms of a film uh, on blues, especially Mississippi blues. And then they approached Robert Palmer, who had left the New York Times, where he was the longtime music critic, also writing for Rolling Stone and others. 
and he had given up that job and he had come from Arkansas and had spent time in Memphis. So he moved back to the Memphis suburbs in Mississippi and um, was just enjoying freelancing, hanging out, had a, had a new girlfriend, another music writer from, uh, from um, Arkansas. And uh, they were approached, you know, would he help with, uh, with a film project? And he said, you know, I'm not really interested, but I tell you, if you could get Bob Muggy to direct it, maybe I'll do it. So I will forever be grateful to him for that. And uh, Eileen next uh, contacted me. We met, uh, I was living in Philly at the time, as I had been for a long time. And we lived, uh, uh, and so I took a train up to New York. We met there and, um, and uh, so I agreed to do it. And then I called Bob and said, please, please, please agree to do it. So this project goes forward. And, um, and, uh, and he did. But actually, I should point out a number of things. One is that I used the same director of photography, a, a very young director of photography on that film that I, that, um, I had on the Al Green film. Oh, wow. And, and also went for a sort of film noir concert look, right. which I knew he had done such a good job with, with the Al Green film. That was quite intentional with the Al Green film and it was quite intentional with this one. And, um, and we also went for the sort of intimacy uh, you're talking about. And uh, I felt like even more than with the Hawaiian film that came before, uh, the Hawaiian dance film, that I needed a way to tie together all these disparate artists and locations and even types of blues or blues related musics and everything. So what I did is I, I came up with this, this narrative device, which was the idea that Dave Stewart was asking Bob to make to record music for a CD that would be a tribute to music because I didn't want to get into a, a whole self-reflexive thing about making a film about the making of a film. Right. So at least this gave us, so, you know, I don't like stretching the truth in a documentary, but I felt this was more enhancing <laughs> the truth. Well, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> uh, and, and I think it worked pretty well. And fortunately um, uh, I got Eileen to lean on Dave to, come spend a little time with us because I, I said, you know, I really think it would help get all those white suburban guitar playing kids to come see real blues if, if there were a rock star in the film. So somewhat reluctantly, he did, he did agree to do it. And he had a great time. He, he, was, he had a group at the time called the Spiritual Cowboys and they were on tour through North America. And, um, so he took 24 hours away from the tour, flew into Memphis, stayed at the Peabody Hotel with the ducks on the roof and everything, which is part of one of the more charming landmarks in, uh, in Memphis. And, um, and then hung out with us when we went to uh, shoot Booker T. Lowry the first night and then the next uh, after his arrival. And then the next day, R.L. Burnside, uh, Junior Kimbrough and Jesse Mill Hemphill Jesse May Hemphill in um, Holly Springs, Mississippi. And, uh, you know, we even have a little bonus footage of, uh, of Dave jamming at Junior's Juke Joint with yeah. R.L. Burnside, um, of which we've used before, but I polished it up a little bit this time. Um, and also for the new uh, Blu-ray and DVD that are coming out in November, um, I've recorded a, a, a commentary which is the first time I've done that. So it runs through the whole film and really tells scene by scene what was going on with us, what happened, what the challenges were, uh, what the fun was. I didn't tell all the dirt. I'm saving some of that for my memoir, filmmaking memoir, which is coming out next year from uh, University of Louisiana at Lafayette Press, in which I tell the stories behind 25 of my, my key music related films. Um, so I have, I have a long essay on the making of deep blues in that, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled with the job, uh, film movement has done with this, uh, all the input they gave me, um, the great job they they've done with, um, with the packaging and, 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 and 
Dave paid me a couple years ago, actually to come up to Montreal. Um, I've, I've worked for years, also the artists who do the work for, for uh, the packaging of most of my, all of my, all of my Blu-rays and DVDs from MVD right. uh, Entertainment Group are all done by uh, uh, Joanna and Bill Howard. Uh, I think they're near Toronto, but, um, but several of my films, I've done video post in Toronto, all at the same facility, which used to be, uh, what's it called? I had it written down so I wouldn't forget. And now I can't <laughs> find the piece of paper. Oh, well, oh, Technicolor. Oh, I, don't know course, if yeah. I don't know if it's still Technicolor, but then um, when it was time to uh, do the 4K, a remaster of Deep Blue's, I called them and asked if they were um, able to do that. And they said, no, but our sister facility, which is now called Diffuse, that's right, Mont yeah. Montreal uh, does it. And I went, just had a wonderful time working with them. They just did a brilliant uh, uh, job with it. Um, so there's a little Canadian connection with. Well, I, I I love it, man. I mean, and you know what? They did do a fantastic job because I mean, it sounds and looks. I mean, it sounds beautiful, but it still feels looks sweaty because and that's important. You got to feel it, you know. <laughs> well, and that's I mean, exactly why Dave did not want to do like Dolby Surround or something right. with the music. He wanted it raw and and uh, and so I mean, it's well mixed. But we kept it, as you say, wrong. Oh, if you'd done some sort of 7.1 nonsense, no, forget it. Yeah, it wouldn't have worked. Right. I mean, just to put a just to put a bow on this, because I mean, I was a fan of the blues before, obviously, before I even knew of your films, but then I got more and more. But I had never seen a diddle bug before. Had had you guys ever seen a diddle bug before you diddle hit the bug. road on this one? The, uh, the diddle bug, which is apparently where Bo Diddley got that name is from Diddley Bows. Um, but uh, had I ever seen one? I can't remember, but I'd certainly never been in close proximity to somebody playing it and had to figure out how to film it and all that. And Lonnie Pitchford, uh, the late Lonnie Pitchford, who was the youngest guy we filmed, and then we're seeing him as the future of Mississippi Blues, and then he goes and dies of AIDS not many years after that but um but yeah he did a wonderful job with that as well as with um as well as with the robert johnson songs he played on guitar and sang in uh, in his in his house we were outside the house attaching a um some broom wire to the to the wall and then he used as you saw a uh, crushed soft drink can to hold the wire out and then he plays it with a pick but um yeah, I, I don't know how much you want me to get into it. I have many crazy stories on the uh, the shooting of these sequences. And oh, give, give, me, give me one. You got to give me one juicy one. All right. Probably the juiciest one. Other than other than the fact that every time we shot, Bob Palmer was a very eccentric. He was a genius, but he was also very eccentric. And he played, he played among me. As many other talents, he played uh, clarinet with the um, uh, the Insect Trust, a uh, kind of a radical rock band that was sort of part part progressive rock, part Ornette Coleman. So he would play clarinet with him, and he brought his clarinet on on our shooting trips. And every night, as as I was preparing to need to film really authentic blues, he'd ask if he could sit in with them with his clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bob, I, I think maybe this that wouldn't be the best approach. And yet, and maybe you maybe you could go sit in the audio recording truck and give them another pair of ears, and that satisfied him. And he and his girlfriend would go in there and and party and listen to the music, and I'm sure offer good advice. But um, now the the craziest of all the stories, which ties directly to the themes of the film in a sense, is that um, uh, when we did our, um, I don't know, let's see, we, we had like a week of pre-production where Bob Palmer and Eileen Gregory and Bob's gr girlfriend and I drove around meeting with all the artists, checking out the locations and all that. Then we came back with a big crew you know, uh, grip, grip and lighting truck, audio 24 track recording truck, you know, vans full of camera and audio people, you know, sort of like 
the American military coming into a small Vietnamese hamlet and overwhelming it. That's sort of us coming into Junior Kimbrough's <laughs> juke joint, for instance. But um, uh, we feel, I, I forget. I think we maybe only shot for like a week and a half initially because we really, really, it was like a different city every day and all that. You could call it a, a drive-by shooting, but hopefully in the, in the best sense. Um, so toward the end, of, uh, of our time, we, we were in one, one day doing uh, Jack Owens and Bud Spires in Bentonia, Mississippi, known for Skip James and other uh, proponents of uh, what came to be known as the Devil, devil Blues. Yeah. Um, but um, Skip James being the best known one. But um, uh, so we filmed there and then we, we rushed up to film uh, Lonnie Pitchford doing his diddly bow and we thought we were going to do um, uh, thought we were going to do the Robert Johnson songs too but it turned out he didn't have a guitar so we just did the diddly bow at that point but so we filmed we got to Bentonia in spite of its sort of the eerie uh, image that it has because the devil blues and everything we got there it was a beautiful sunny day we got directed to um Jack Owens' house, we arrive, he's in a good mood, he's direct, he's uh, dressed to the nines. Oh, we had picked up Bud Spires, the harp player, the blind harp player on the way, brought him over. They're in great mood, they do a fantastic performance. We do great shooting. Um, and then we go on and do Lonnie, Lonnie Pitchford. Well, a few days later, I'm at home in Philadelphia, I receive uh, I, you know, I, I, we had sent from Memphis all the, the film and audio to my lab in Richmond, Virginia, lab that was in existence at the time. And um, so many film labs have closed for obvious reasons, mm. but uh, that I worked with them for about 20 years. Um, and uh, all of a sudden I get a phone call and they say, we got some bad news for you. I said, geez, what? said, well, you know that stuff you shot with those two guys sitting on the front porch and everything? I said, yeah. He said, well, it looks like it's on fire. It's totally, it's totally ruined. And I oh, said, no. oh man, send it to me so I can see. And it was, it looks like there are flames through the picture. Now, the logical, probable cause of this is somebody you know, in those days when we were shooting film, you would you would have these changing bags, black changing bags, and you'd have these film magazines. Right. And so you would um, you would put the the film into the film magazine, seal it tight inside the bag, put put the magazine on the camera, shoot, and put it back in the bag to remove the film again, put it in cans, seal the cans. So the the camera assistants we had that day swear nothing happened, swear everything was fine. The people at the lab who also could have done something swear that nothing happened there. So didn't matter. Fortunately, Eileen Gregory had done something, had been able to afford to do something that I mostly had not with my previous films, which was pay for what's called negative insurance, where if you anything goes wrong on location or at the lab, the insurance company pays for you to totally reshoot th those scenes. So what a blessing, you know, we didn't have crew. We just need to take a small crew, but a few months later, not now, not the, it's now not the fall. It's the winter. It's well into the winter. It's like, was it like February or early March or something? I can't remember. We show up. It's a gray, dreary, dismal day. Um, uh, Jack Owens has a cold. He's, um, he's, uh, uh, I mean, he's in a good enough mood, but he's obviously not feeling well. So we go and film everything and it seems fine. They'd still do a good performance. There's maybe not quite the passion there was that first time because, you know, the right. Yeah. And everything. So we get it all done. And then this time we brought along a guitar. We went to see Lonnie Pitchford again and got him to do those wonderful <clears throat> renditions of, uh, of uh, three Robert Johnson songs. Uh, get home, 
waiting for the film lab, call me, say, the picture's fine. Got a problem with the audio. Turns out, because this was a last minute thing, my audio director, his, his um, Nagra had been in the shop uh, be getting maintenance and they couldn't finish it in time for us to leave. So he had rented one and he thought he had checked it out, but it turned out one of the stereo heads was out of alignment. So every so often something would distort. Fortunately, I was able to edit around any bad problems and, and represent them fairly well in the film. But, you know, my moral for all this has long been, do not mess with the devil in Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> no good, no good can come of it. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, we were very fortunate, got some wonderful performances, uh, met some wonderful guys, all of whom are dead now, as is Bob Palmer. Yeah. Um, sort of Dave Stewart and I are sort of the last men standing uh, well, and, and I guess the two producers, Eileen Gregory and Dave's brother, um, uh, John Stewart. But um, yeah, all the headliners from the film are gone. And even guys like Will Dave Thompson, who was backing up um, uh, Roosevelt Booby Barnes, he's the other guitarist there to his right as you're facing him. And he later became... Um, uh, you know, fairly prominent in that region in his own right. And I worked with him on another film, but then he died in a car accident. And um, anyway, so it's, it's a little bit bittersweet, you know, 30 years later uh, showing this again. Um, and I feel a little strange taking bows for something I did so long ago as well, but um, we're thrilled to have it remastered and back out there for people to see. And um I hope, uh, you know, there's there's not much of a theatrical window, obviously. It opens in New York uh, uh, this coming Wednesday, and but then the home video release is November uh, 23rd. Ironically, R.L. Burns, the late R.L. Burnside's 95th birthday um, is the day we're, uh, we're releasing it. Oh, that's fitting. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, has a nice resonance to it. For sure, Matt. Now, I mean, just last question. I got to put a bow on this, but last question. Uh, your a films have bow? always been... Go ahead. What? I'm sorry, a diddly bow? Uh, no, you, your films have always been very beautiful to, to watch, very visually engaging. But at the same time, the, the passion for the music is never is always there. I'm kind of curious, how have over the years you managed to sort of keep the filmmaker side of your brain in check versus the music <laughs> fan? And, uh, <laughs> well... Well, it's funny, it, it, it even comes down also to the director part of the brain versus the producer part of the brain, right. because except for Deep Blues, I produced, I mean, and, and I sort of produced that one, I didn't get the credit for doing it, but I hired the crew and worked up the budget and all those things. But um, the producer side, I'm very sorry. I do not know why United Healthcare would be so rude as to call me in the middle of an interview. I, I only had let had not turned off the ringer in case you needed to call me as we were getting set up on all the good. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, uh, you know, my budgets have always been limited, and and one of the ways in which um, which I've been able to keep control uh, artistically is by keeping the budgets relative relatively low but yet the um the director in me wants to get that beautiful shot wants to get that perfect song wants to uh, uh wants to engage in various levels of storytelling whether it's an actual narrative of things that are happening that we're documenting whether it's developing themes throughout it or whether it's as simple as telling the story of the presentation of a song shooting it in such a way that there's there's a um, a progression that you're getting that you're visually getting all these relationships between among the musicians between the musicians and the audience often uh things like that um so trying to do all these other things but um the uh, i guess one of the ways i've been able to keep it fresh is i've never had to make a film about a subject that I didn't care about. And when you have to spend 
up to a year on a project, that's really important. For sure. Is that, yeah, you, you know, when you're coming to that editing, film editing table or now computer day after day after day for months, um, you know, often hearing the same stuff over and over, you sure better like it. And I've been, I've been very fortunate that, uh, that I've been able to, um, to focus on music musicians that I really felt well you know my original reason for getting into this was the corporate entertainment complex if you will the years you know they focus on the lowest common denominator for sure they, and you know which is not to say you can't be a brilliant mainstream artist again a Louis Armstrong or, or a Duke Ellington or a Bob Dylan or or whatever but uh, David Bowie but um but they overlook so much that's important and I started out way before the days where you could take your your iPhone or whatever and go film somebody's performance and actually get high quality video and and uh, audio um, you know there were there were very few people going into these juke joints and road houses and front parlors and all that where where some of the most important traditional music um, was being created. And so it became my goal to whatever I had to do, find ways to, to document and through that both promote and preserve some of these artists that I considered uh, so much more important than what was, that was getting through on the main TV networks and, and record labels and, and so forth. Um, I forget what else I was going to say in that regard, but you've yeah, said, you've said it, you, you've said it beautifully. And I mean, you've done that. And then some, my friend, and you know what, thank you for the work and putting us on the front porch with these legends. And thank you for the time today. This was, oh, this was an absolute delight. Thank you for the time. I, you know, I, I, I've, I've been to your blog and think it's really impressive, but I, I was a little concerned that maybe you thought I made horror films. Oh because, God, no, not <laughs> you 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 do want, so many but, Yeah. <laughs> In fact, Canada does a lot of horror films. My friends Joanne and Bill Howard are constantly doing home video packaging and movie posters for horror films, it seems like. You know what? Honestly, in Ontario, the indie horror scene is kind of out of control. It's really it weird. And I mean, be. a lot of it's getting sold to the States. It's really amazing to see. That's great. I mean, all the children and grandchildren of David Cronenberg and all. Pretty much, that's exactly, yeah. it's all his fault, more or less. So. <laughs> yes, it is. I, I, I'll never forget the first time I was in a theater with scanners, watching those heads blow up. I thought, <laughs> this is changing my life. <laughs> I did not know film could all this. <laughs> well, it's a beautiful thing. You know what, Bob, just thanks again, man. I really enjoyed this. I've been a big fan of yours for years. Oh, that's lovely, Dave. Thanks so much. And that, now I'm glad to have discovered your, your blog, and I know it too to do with any spare time now. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Take care. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental, or purchasing needs this summer, as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.